Um, first of all, let me say that uh, it's been a pleasure uh, visiting today at Vanderbilt. I've had wonderful discussions all day. And uh, I'm, I'm really glad that I had an opportunity to, to get to know Vanderbilt. And I hope that uh, this will not be the first time that I'll come to Vanderbilt, that, uh, that, uh, that we will continue to build a strong relationship uh, with all of you. Just out of curiosity, uh, how many of you know Oak Ridge National Laboratory? I've heard of Oak Ridge National Laboratory. I'm amazed. I was, I was telling somebody today that you know, when I first uh, uh, got my job offer at Oak Ridge, I called, like all dutiful sons do, called home and said, guess what, I got a job. And it took me about 30 minutes trying to explain to my parents uh, where Oak Ridge was. Just first, I, mean, I didn't know where Oak Ridge was. Uh, I knew it was somewhere in Tennessee. And, and of course, we had, knew the significance of Manhattan Project, but not the direct connection between Oak Ridge and Manhattan Project. And I thought I'll be at Oak Ridge for maximum a year, maybe two. But here I am 23 years later. So it's a great place to work. And it's certainly a great place to live and, and raise a family. So um, I'm, I'm really glad that I was uh, given this opportunity to talk to you. I, I tried to decide. In fact, I ran into this distinguished uh, professor that you have here, and I asked, uh, you know, what uh, should I go deep into a technical topic, or uh, uh, or or keep it more introductory? And of course, I was told go deep into a technical topic, but I never take advice anyway. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I'm I'm going to give you a a glimpse of Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and I'm sure that you will have an opportunity to learn more about it. Um, the the title of the presentation is Advanced Computing for a Clean Energy Future. Um, computing has been something that I've been involved with all my, uh, my career, especially high performance computing the last 10 years or so. And, and so um, in, in many ways, the reason for Oak Ridge uh, investing in, in uh, both the people and the infrastructure to drive this particular technology is the belief that it's going to accelerate uh, innovation and scientific discovery in the important area of energy. Why is energy important? Well, clearly, uh, it, is, it touches every aspect of our life, every aspect of our economy. And it is something that is uh, very important to the future uh, of, of not only this nation, but, but in, in, in some sense, the vitality of the planet. Perhaps the best way to illustrate this is, uh, I think it was uh, on the 10th of January, there was an op-ed by Thomas Friedman. I don't know whether uh, you read that. Uh, I think it is titled, Look Who's Sleeping Now, I think is the title. And it was uh, an interview with the first CEO of Hong Kong, uh, appointed by uh, the Chinese government. And uh, I think I'm sort of paraphrasing the quote, but basically, uh, uh, Mr. Tang said, uh, uh, during the Industrial Revolution, China was asleep at the wheel. During the Information Technology Revolution, China was barely waking up. And in the Green Energy Revolution, uh, China intends to fully participate uh, in, in the Green Energy Revolution. And he had uh, other examples of uh, the tremendous amount of innovation that is occurring. But, but the point that was being made is even in there that China wants to be a partner with the US because we still lead the world in research and development in innovation. And given that energy is a planetary problem, uh, it's certainly something in, it's incumbent upon us to try to tackle that problem and in being the leaders of uh, innovation and scientific discovery in this important field, we have an opportunity to re retain our competitive edge, both economically as well as in terms of the research enterprise. And Oak Ridge being a DOE national laboratory focused primarily on, let me see whether it's gonna work, ah, primarily on uh, uh, energy, um, this is particularly important to us. Um, 
This is just a snapshot of Oak Ridge, about $1.7 billion of annual budget, um, about 4,500 employees. Uh, what's really significant is uh, the, the 4,000 research guests that we have annually. These are not people who visit for a day. You know, so for example, I, I'm here for a day, I would not be considered as a guest. These are people who come anywhere for anywhere between a couple of weeks to a couple of years to come stay with us and collaborate on a research uh, enterprise. And so essentially that is doubling our research uh, professionals in, in many ways if you want to think about it. People like me who are transients who come for a day, we have about 30,000 of those each year. Uh, we went through a massive renovation project. Uh, uh, what Oak Ridge is traditionally known for is its uh, materials research. We have uh, wonderful infrastructure as well as tremendous talent. Um, over the past couple of years, we brought online the world's most powerful neutron source, the pulse neutron source. It's particularly interesting because it allows us to look at soft materials, biological materials, and it, for, it allows us to look at fairly sizable uh, chunk of materials, about say five nanometer cube, which is about the same size that our big computers now allow us to sort of build up from an atomic scale. And so there's a perfect confluence of uh, experimental devices that allow us to go to very small scale and computers that are allowing us to develop understanding uh, from sort of bottom up, if you will. Um, we certainly say that we are the most powerful open scientific computing facility. I will tell you there is not another place on earth where you have as much compute capability and computational scientists co-located as Oak Ridge. And, uh, and that's something that has occurred over the last 10 years or so. And so this is, in some sense, a proof that uh, an institution can focus on a few key important things. And if you really focus on the outcomes, you can achieve that. And of course, we do uh, manage a large energy portfolio as well as uh, other projects. Um, uh, last April, I was asked to become the deputy director at Oak Ridge. And this is how I sort of organize my job. If you ask me what I do, uh, these are the priorities that I have. Oak Ridge, is a, as I said, it's a, is a, has a long and important tradition. But in some sense, uh, we, any institution, for example, can re-energize its culture. In some sense, establish clear priorities, focus on a key set of initiatives and outcomes, strengthen the impact that we have in, and by delivering solutions that are important, particularly in the energy field. Um, one of the things that I always like to say, as I mentioned before, it took me about 30 minutes to explain to my family what Oak Ridge was and what I was going to do. That's not the case, you know, I'm sure that when you, you know, uh, when people hear about Vanderbilt or, or, or MIT or Stanford or Harvard, people, in, in, they know world over that who you are and, and, and the reputation of the organization. Because we are a national laboratory and our heritage is uh, from the Cold War, which is much more uh, private and, and kept behind the curtain, if you will, we haven't had that kind of an exposure. However, um, as, you, as you noticed, uh, the world has dramatically changed in the last uh, uh, decade or so, and we are increasingly called upon to perform uh, fundamental research and also translational research, tying basic science to applied technology. And that requires, that's a collaborative effort, and that requires reaching out to the best minds wherever they are. And, and so we are becoming much more of an open, transparent organization that builds on collaboration, that builds on uh, partnership. And uh, the third priority is graduate research and education. Uh, like many of the uh, enterprise uh, in this country, we have the baby boom bubble going through where people are eligible to retire at Oak Ridge. 50% of our staff are eligible to retire in the next five to six years. I, which I think I just came just yesterday, I am eligible to retire in six years. And, and so, uh, basically bringing in the next generation of people who are going to do both the science as well as the management of research and science is very important. And so playing an active role in, in creating the talent pipeline is very important. Uh, it's also a carrot to attract some of the very best people. Many times when we recruit people, they, uh, there are many other researchers who would like to have a close tie with academia. 
and, and graduate students are the glue that makes it happen. We partner broadly uh, with international institutions. We have our, our 4,500 staff um, represent about 85 nations. And so, you know, we have pretty broad-based uh, talent. And, and the, the last thing is something that I'm, I'm, we're working on that is measuring progress against goals. One of, the, one of the problems and one of the advantages is that once you have measurable goals, you can focus on it. But it's very important that you pick the right goals because you will have unintended consequences if you don't pick those goals carefully. So those are my priorities in a nutshell. And I'm not going to elaborate on this since, uh, since Peter has already t told you what our budget looks like. Essentially, a big third of our budget is, of $1.7 billion is basic science. Another third is applied technology in the energy field. And the, and the last third is national security. The various slices and dices are basically various program offices within Department of Energy as well as other agencies. And, and Department of Energy believes that we have 15 core capabilities, and that's what's listed in, the, in the, the columns and the key sponsors and resources. If we were to look at what it is that we believe is our hallmark and what we would like to see as a hallmark for the laboratory, it is to be a trans translational research organization tying our fundamental basic science, which is you know, about $600 million worth of research, to uh, applied technology deliverables, particularly in the energy space. So, Energy is a defining challenge of our time. The major driver is climate change. Uh, obviously, most of you are aware of uh, the discussions that uh, um, about 160 CEOs of countries uh, um, met in Copenhagen trying to figure out whether they could have a climate change bill. Um, we have a climate change bill going through Congress today. After Copenhagen, I'm not sure that we will have a climate change bill. If we do not have a climate change bill, there is likely to be an energy development bill, which for you, I will translate it as instead of more implementation, more research. So from a university or a national laboratory perspective, what that means is that increased research in trying to understand the uncertainty in climate change as well as our ability to measure and validate emissions, national security, economic competitiveness and quality of life. Um, we ha there have been a number of analysis that said that uh, incremental changes to existing technologies not, is not going to get us to any kind of measurable um, progress towards a stable carbon uh, content in the atmosphere. So the expectation is that you need transformational advances. And certainly Oak Ridge believes that computational technologies together with other experimental technologies are going to be key in driving those change. Um, this is, uh, um, in, in some sense, a new administration uh, has made it a priority. The 10-year outlook for science and energy is promising. Um, the, the three agencies or sub-agencies uh, that is listed uh, there, Department of uh, uh, Office of Science within DOE, NIST within Department of Commerce, and NSF, the three, they are considered as the three science agencies are all slated for doubling of their budget over a seven-year horizon. And, and uh, if, as I expect, if I have to speculate, I would say that uh, the president's uh, budget will have an emphasis on climate change and cl clean energy technology. It has already manifested in the current year budgets, and I expect it to be even more stronger in the upcoming budget. Um, for the first time, you know, the joke around uh, the DOE circle is that for the first time, the Department of Energy does not need its national laboratories. The secretary and the undersecretaries are world-class scientists, Nobel laureates. They can do the science themselves. Fortunately, he has to work the rope lines. So, uh, and, and so what it means is that there is a real profound understanding of the importance of science and research, and I expect this to be in and a really interesting time in the in upcoming years. In many ways, it's an alternate universe we live in because um, uh, it, at a time of fiscal crisis, because of stimulus and because of the in need for investment in R&D, the research enterprise uh, is fairly vibrant at this time. What are DOE's priorities and goals? Energy, climate, and competitiveness are its forefront. Those are the, the five 
key areas are listed below, science and discovery, energy, economic prosperity, national security, and climate change. These are the areas where the Department of Energy is investing and will continue to invest in the upcoming years. And just to give, emphasize the potential for collaboration between uh, laboratory and the, and the university community, this is an expansion of uh, DOE's priorities in science and discovery. If you look at it, what it says is that it's going to focus on transformational science, not incremental science. Um, Re-energize national labs as centers of great science and innovation. Embrace a degree of risk-taking and research. Create an effective mechanism to integrate national laboratory, university, and industry activities. Develop science and engineering talent and collaborate universally. And, and the emphasis on collaboration universally is loud and clear from, from Washington. So, meeting uh, world energy demands, uh, to, to borrow a cliche, no silver bullet and no free lunch. By 2050, uh, the population is expected to grow by about 50% and the world energy demand will grow by about two acts. Uh, what you're seeing today, uh, what you see in that distribution is uh, world energy production in 2005, and what you would, if you add up, you will see that it's roughly about, what, 14, 15 percent is uh, uh, non-fossil. The rest of everything else is uh, fossil fuel. And, and this, hence, the, the, the China's desire to be, to fully participate in developing renewable technology. Um, during December, I had an opportunity. I, w I had a meeting in India that I had to go to, and s I was flying through Dubai, and I was invited to meet with, uh, with the Crown Prince of uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, he just, for those of you who are interested in trivia, he just bought a yacht. It only cost $454 million. Um, but he's also building a university, a, a research university, and what they are trying to do is to um, basically plan for a time when they will have to diversify from an oil-based economy. Abu Dhabi has a, a population of a million people today. 20% are, are, are uh, citizens. 80% are migrant workers um, in all, all, all walks of life. And they expect by 2030 uh, the population to go to 3 million. I don't think that they can produce children that fast, so that means more people going to work there. And they are, they are starting a university with an endowment of roughly about $10 billion, and a, uh, which is not comparable. KAUST started with $25 billion, the, the university in Saudi Arabia. The point is that we are not the only people who are thinking about and worried about a solution for the energy problem. Everybody who has got a, has a stake in it, and they're all working towards it. The U.S. picture is not that much different. We consume about a fourth of the, what is that, we are 5% of the population and consume about 25% of the energy. Um, and so, and if you look at it, our uh, ratio of uh, renewables to fossil fuel based energy is not that dissimilar from the rest of the world. Um, so, here is when things get a little bit more regional. So if you look at it, uh, out of the 15%, uh, 8% the, the is nuclear, uh, and non-fossil non is, uh, is nuclear, and 7% is renewable. Um, and if you look at the renewable, you're looking at solar, wind, geothermal, hydroelectric, and biomass. I can tell you, we have pretty much tapped out hydroelectric, certainly in this part of the uh, the, the, the country. Um, we don't have a lot of wind uh, in this part of the country. Um, and so basically what that means is that if you're going to tackle a, a if you were to make a regional solution that scales to national level, uh, as Oak Ridge National Laboratory, the areas that we are likely to concentrate on is nuclear. We are likely to concentrate on biomass or, or biofuels, and we are likely to concentrate on solar energy. And, and so those are the three areas where we see a lot more potential for uh, uh, 
uh, research and investment. That's not to say that we will not work in other areas because we are a national laboratory and we have national purposes, but in some sense, many decisions are made locally simply because of the collaborations and interactions that we have. And, and so TVA, for example, is a great partner with, uh, in, in, in when it comes to nuclear. Let me give you another example, by the way, that's very important for all of you to understand, is that the policy make decisions that we make have huge consequences. Since Three Mile Island, we haven't licensed any nuclear, any new nuclear power plants. Let me tell you how that impacts the economy, in addition to all the obvious direct connections. Recently, uh, Jordan um, uh, announced a new contract for a, uh, for a nuclear power plant. The award was given to South Korea. Abu Dhabi is getting ready to announce four nuclear power plants plus an option for another two. Uh, U.S. companies were not even down-selected. They were kicked out right at the beginning. The reason is the U.S. companies do not have any experience, in recent experience, building nuclear power plants. And so the advantage that we have in order to get back into the market is not, you know, mass production of existing designs of nuclear reactors. We need to get to the next generation where our innovation and our research is going to make us more competitive in the marketplace because that is the edge and that's where we need to focus on. So uh, I'm sure that you have seen this. This is the, this is the, the, the famous fingerprint of climate change that uh, people have used to drive policy decisions. The atmospheric concentration of CO2 is clearly uh, increasing rapidly. These are measured uh, data from 1990 to 99, about 1.5 parts per million per year. In the 2000 to 2007, it's two parts per million, and then it's going up to 2.2. Um, obviously, this is being contributed by the growth in world economy, namely China and India. That's where you know, China is producing bringing online a power plant one, uh, one a week, about 50 new gigawatt level uh, power pl uh, plants in, in China. And, and so um, there, is nothing, there is no way that you're going to convince a politician to think about future generation when the current generation is starving. And that is sort of the situation that China and India has. So until they get to a certain level of economic prosperity, my suspicion, many, many people project that we'll continue to uh, put more carbon in the atmosphere. So we will quickly go to adaptation and mitigation uh, as opposed to a, a treaty that somehow caps uh, uh, carbon emission in the atmosphere, uh, capping it at about 450 parts per million. What you, what you see is that climate forcing is both stronger and uh, is expected sooner, the impact is expected sooner. Uh, so what are the challenges? Well, frankly, we do a lot of climate modeling, but there are lots of approximation. It is a chaotic system, and we are just learning. And so we're pretty good at pr uh, predicting uh, hind casting. So we can model the, uh, the cl uh, climate system in a fairly high fidelity and sh demonstrate that it projects and, and predicts past scenarios and behavior pretty well. Now, the question that we have to answer is that, therefore, can you project to the future, and is the projection valid? A lot of uncertainties, and so my expectation is that DOE and other agencies like NOAA and NSF is going to be investing a lot of resources in the upcoming years in uh, uncertainty quantification, as well as in improved measurements, and, and basically also uh, being able to uh, model climate change in regional scale using global models as opposed to just uh, regional models and looking at long-term decadal type of consequences. So this is, where, this is an example. This is a work that is done on Jaguar, uh, the, the, the supercomputer at Oak Ridge. Um, what, you, what you're seeing is basically clouds. It's, it's, it's uh, 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 an aggregate of uh, the water vapor uh, that is uh, um, uh, calculated as part of this detailed model. And this is the first time that we are able to, to, be, uh, to simulate um, uh, this at this level of detail. And you can see, um, let me go back and see what I get. You can see the kind of, if you look at uh, the, uh, the, the southern part of India, you can see the kind of cyclone activity that you would normally 
uh, expect to see that part of the world. So uh, these are things that we would not be able to, we would not have been able to simulate last year. And for the first time, we are able to do this because of the resolution and the improvements in the model uh, that, is a, that, that is driven by high performance computing. So <clears throat> if you're driving both adaptation mitigation as well as new technology, clearly you want to understand these type of phenomena at a certain level of detail. This is really amazing to me. This, what you're seeing is the same simulation on the right-hand side. It's a 28-kilometer global resolution. On the left-hand side, it's 3.5-kilometer resolution. And uh, uh, for the, these are, now you're seeing the cloud, you know, the puffs of cloud, if you will, at the same scale as a satellite uh, uh, you know, observation. And, and the NASA folks, who's, this is again calculation done uh, at Oak Ridge um, with, with our collaborators, and, and they, they couldn't believe it that this was actually uh, a direct numerical simulation. This is not post-processing of data. It is really direct numerical simulation results, which looks very much like satellite telemetry. So again, trying to give you a sense of how these computers at this scale allows you to study uh, uh, these kinds of effects. Uh, I just want to acknowledge that this Oak Ridge is really uh, fortunate in that we have, in, in the area of climate, we have investment from Foundation, Department of Defense, NASA, DOE, and NOAA. And so there's really not too many places where all the agencies have come together to support this kind of an effort. What we are trying to do is to take these high fidelity simulations and combine with other expertise that we have in global information systems. Uh, we have a group by, um, I don't know whether you've interacted with him, a fellow by the name Budu Badri. He, he and his group have the most detailed pop, global population database. And so when, the, when we had the tsunami uh, a few years ago, um, the United Nations activated this team so that they could actually real-time calculate what the population impact would be so that they could actually mobilize UN relief efforts based on the calculation. So higher the, you know, where it's, uh, the intensity, where it's red, uh, that's where the highest density of population is. How does this impact uh, energy and water? So <clears throat> this is India. I, I'm, I'm actually from one of those real bright red spots towards the southern tip of India uh, from a state called Kerala. But what's really interesting is that this is the first time, I'm from India, but I never really appreciated, you know, when you have, the, the state that I come from is 200 miles long, but 50 miles wide at the widest as a population of Canada. And, and so at, after, at, after a certain level, you cannot sense the population density. You know, I mean, it is dense as it gets from your, from your perception point of view. And I was amazed to see the density, uh, which makes sense. It's the foothills of the Himalayas, which is, uh, you know, fed by fresh water from the melting glaciers. That is the, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the fed by Ganges. And people are speculating now that uh, you would actually, Ganges will run dry because glaciers will disappear during the summer months, probably in the next 10, 15 years. Imagine, that, you know, that's, you're looking at about 300, 400 million people in that region, and if Ganges runs dry during some parts, you know, a few months of the year, that means you don't have fresh water to, to, to supply water for that much population. The, the consequences are, are huge. And so, you know, these, these, are, these are interconnected, challenging problems uh, in, a, in a global scale. So we can break the connection between energy use and CO2. It's possible. All you have to do is look at France. In the middle of the, middle of the chart, you will see a green line for France where, you are, where they have successfully increased per capita use of energy without increasing the CO2 emission per capita. The reason is majority of their power comes from nuclear power. So policy, that, so there is a technological solution to, to these kinds of global problems. You know, uh, back in the day, I forget the exact uh, reference, you know, people, people said that we're going to run out of food and there's going to be huge global catastrophe. 
and then fertilizers were discovered and we have now plenty of food and we eat all the time, particularly Americans, as we do. Uh, I used to be a thin guy when, before I came here. And then I eat all the time, I snack all the time and uh, there you have it. Um, the, w there's actually an interesting policy discussion where it says that you know, uh, if you look going, you know, go, if you look into the future, you would say that if you, you can, this is not sustainable, that there is, we are going to face another catastrophe, unless two things happen: that there is actually transformational discoveries plus policy decision. And and my sense is that the world will, at some point in time, get to disruptive transformational technology in the energy uh, front and there'll be some sort of a cap and trade or carbon tax or whatever that drives people to do you know, to, to, to the right behavior. But, but here's an example of France doing their policy decision driving the right behavior. You cannot see the same effect, but Brazil, the slope of the curve is much uh, uh, more flatter than the rest of the world, and that's primarily based on their biofuels. They use uh, uh, biofuels to uh, ethanol to drive much of their transportation. So wh when I look at it from an Oak Ridge point of view, these are some of the essential energy technologies that we feel that we need to tackle, biofuels, hybrid electric vehicles, nuclear energy for, for power production, renewable wind, solar, advanced liquid fuels for coal, glass, coal gasification. When you have distributed power sources, obviously you need a much smarter grid. Uh, Carbon capture sequestration, every policy analysis that has been done, people believe that carbon capture and sequestration is going to be an important mix to the, uh, the sol solution and major improvements in energy efficiency ne needs to be made as well. Each, each opportunity has positive and negative aspects. You know, it, there is n nothing is easy. Um, if you have nuclear power, carbon free electricity, but there's large water requirements. I don't know whether you recall, but uh, TVA had to shut down their nuclear power plant because they were heating the lake to the point where it was going to impact uh, you know, the wildlife or fish. Uh, and so, so there's, it's got large water requirements, spend, spend nuclear fuel, you know, how many Yucca Mountains, and uh, also non-proliferation or proliferation issues are there, biofuels. Again, it's a low net carbon fuel, but it competes with food for land and water. The point is that it's a messy problem. If it was easy, it would have been solved. So it's, it, but the good news is that it requires a lot of very sharp, bright people to, to tackle these challenging problems. And many of you is go, are going to tackle this over the next 20 years because I believe the solution is going to be found and adopted in the next two decades. There are other te te you know, technology challenges associated with it, many of these things, um, and it's listed here. I'm not going to go into details, but uh, what I would say is it's premature to pick winners. Uh, and so it, we are going to work on this over the next decade or two, and I believe focused partnerships are required in every area because it is a big problem that no one institution is going to handle by itself. So I want to again touch on modeling and simulation. If you look at well, how we've done things before, uh, you know, essentially we do a lot of experiments and then you develop a theory to, to sort of explain the experiments. And, and, and so, or you have theory that drives experiments, but basically it is not a coupled process. Modeling and simulation, what it's allowed us to do is to really extrapolate our knowledge based on fundamental laws of physics uh, uh, so that we can cut down on the number of experimentation. Uh, recently there was a study done by the Council on Competitiveness where Boeing used modeling and simulation to cut down the wind tunnel experiments, both therefore uh, for the Dreamliner, designed the Dreamliner uh, uh, aircraft, cutting down both time and money and therefore making it a much more competitive product. And so we are trying to uh, basically adopt the same uh, aspect of modeling and simulation in, in, in energy technologies. It's obviously being driven by, by uh, computers uh, that are being developed at very, very high, high rate. This is one area that the U.S. dominates the world, except for the couple of years where the Japanese Earth Simulator uh, led the world, which 
I don't know whether, how many of you re remember it. It was in 2002 that the Earth Simulator was introduced. At that time, it was a big, whopping 40 teraflops machine. And here we are six years, seven years later, or eight years later now. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's not even in the round off era. So there is no other technology that grows at the same uh, speed. Uh, um, uh, so what you see are the, some of the top machines. Uh, but what's really remarkable is that if you look on the left-hand side, these are scientific applications that are already running at sustained petascale performance. And uh, again, there is no other place in the world where applications are running in sustained performance, sustained petascale performance other than in Tennessee, because there are no other machines out there that is capable of performing at this scale. Uh, and so it is a tremendous advantage both for Tennessee as well as uh, uh, the United States. Um, you know, um, these kinds of large numbers fly through, but you know, when you think about it, it takes a tremendous amount of thinking and analysis and bright people working on really challenging problems. When, when we, in response to the Japanese Earth Simulator, which was a whopping 40 teraflops, we wrote the proposal that established National Center for Computational Sciences at Oak Ridge and started with the three teraflop Cray X1 in 2004, which at the time was a very substantial machine. And, and today at Oak Ridge, we have four machines, uh, two that belongs to NSF and two that belongs to DOE, in addition to very large classified machines. And NOAA is getting ready to build another big petaflop machine at Oak Ridge in the next couple of months for focus primarily on climate. This is a kind of resource that is unprecedented, and it's driving new insight in a number of application areas. But, but even more interesting is that we, are, we have been approved to build a 20 petaflop system that is going to go online in 2011. And uh, DOE is planning on building a 1,000 petaflop system in 2018. Um, and, and in order to make that happen, it is going to be really uh, challenging, and there's going to be all kinds of innovation in hardware, processors, software, application. And, and I think the next half a dozen or so years is going to be an exciting time. It's, uh, this is just an illustration to say that you get as much uh, advance in our ability to simulate from uh, new algorithms and methods as you get from hardware. So the bottom right, uh, chart shows you how uh, initially it was vector machines, both in the U.S. and the Japan, and sort of asymptoted out, and that's when we switched to sort of massively parallel uh, machines. And we thought that it was going to just crank up the, uh, the clock speed on the processors until we ran out of headroom there. We decided to go multi-core, and, uh, and now we're going to go, the 2011 machine is going to be based on a hybrid multi-core architecture where you're going to have very large number of accelerators in a single die with traditional uh, x86 processors. So uh, again, uh, you get similar orders of magnitude performance improvement in applications, so brain power, as you get from raw CPU improvement, performance improvement from computers. Uh, we don't, um, you know, we have some really bright, talented people, both at Oak Ridge and our collaborators across the world. We're making some significant imp impact in a variety of areas from turbulence um, to, to fusion energy. And, and so this is just giving you a, a quick uh, sort of uh, view on some of the important areas that we're working on. Um, Peter already discussed this. I won't uh, go into this. Um, so uh, what we're trying to do really is that getting um, a DOE is going to have a new um, uh, call for um, uh, an, a, a, an innovation hub in, in, in nuclear uh, energy. Uh, it is basically f focused on safety, non-proliferation, waste management, advanced fuel cycles. Oak Ridge plan to compete for it, and uh, we are working with our partners developing a, a new uh, simulation uh, framework for these big, massively uh, parallel systems. Uh, in, in these areas, and, and we are excited about that, and uh, um, we hope that we are going to be successful in that competition. We will know in the next uh, few months, but regardless, there is the, whether we win or our competitors win, they are going to be doing their simulation on, on the computers at Oak Ridge, simply because that's what's available to them. 
Uh, we do the same thing in uh, biofuels. Uh, again, because it's something that's very important. We believe that it's an, uh, something that uh, East Tennessee uh, has a lock on. This is really calculation, designing new enzymes to break down uh, the cellulosic material, in this case for switchgrass. And um, um, this is particularly exciting because we believe that not only are we uh, solving the, uh, the energy, you know, so you're converting cellulosic material to sugars to ethanol, which then get blended with petroleum for, for gasoline. But, but there's a whole host of bioproducts that we hope will come out of it. So it is going to be an exciting time in driving this. Uh, this is just basically to say that uh, 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 this is because of the terrain that we have, the lowland uh, uh, switchgrass is something that we are developing both from feedstock as well as uh, trying to build a product Aligned for, for, for this particular area. Uh, energy storage is another important topic. Uh, this is something that uh, we work very closely with. I'm sure that some of, you know, Peter is uh, aware and involved in some aspects of this. Uh, um, uh, we have a big partnership with IBM and several other laboratories in trying to build uh, the next generation. You know, essentially we call it a 500 mile battery to drive uh, uh, um, e you know, electric vehicle. If, if my colleague uh, Gil Weigand was here, he would say that what he wants to do in life is to basically uh, put you know, our, our cars on the grid and make, take the home off the grid by making it co-generating power through photovoltaics or other means. We may not get there, but it's the kind of ambitious goals that we would like to, 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 to tackle. Combustion is another important area because no matter what we're going to have, you know, our big 18-wheelers, uh, 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 airplanes, etc., we are still going to burn fossil fuel. And so in improving the combustion is very important and something that, uh, in fact, DOE is organizing a workshop next week, I believe, to figure out what is the important challenge that need to be met here. Uh, this is some work that we, we are doing in uh, superconductivity where experiment and simulation is driving uh, the scientific field forward uh, together. So um, hopefully I've given you a sense of uh, why prediction at this scale is important for advanced energy systems. Um, it offers significant potential to improve performance and reduce development times. Uh, and, and that's uh, the energy innovation hubs the DOE is uh, hoping to compete in the coming years is intent. It will have a strong modeling component. Uh, the community has devoted a considerable attention to this challenge. If you have not been uh, involved in many of these workshops, you should consider yourself lucky because there has been too many. Uh, in fact, uh, next week I'm supposed to be simultaneously in the West Coast and the East Coast, and I haven't yet figured out how to do that. So uh, there's lots of these workshops, which is how the government builds new multi-billion dollar program. So the good news is that all these chaos normally results in new research programs that drive substantial progress and innovation. The exascale computing is viewed as a cross-cutting capability that is going to integrate the department. It's focused on these topics. And uh, I just want to give you a sense of how challenging this is. In 2018, if you're going to start, stand up an exascale uh, computer, you have to scale applications to millions, uh, of course. Right now, we are up to 200,000. Um, some people say perhaps billions, of course. The algorithms, uh, challenges, as well as large application teams and computational scientists. This is just, if for those of you who are really interested in system specs, uh, that gives you a sense of the scale uh, of, of the challenges. Today, the biggest computer, the most powerful computer in Oak Ridge has 300 terabytes of memory. So in, in principle, when you write out a file, every time you write out a file, you're dumping about a third of a petabyte into disk. Um, the exascale machine will have 10 petabytes of memory is what we project. And each of the nodes will be about 10 teraflops. So how you go about doing this is going to be dramatically different. And look at the power consumption. Um, last year, there was a publication that said that the exascale computer is likely to require about 100 megawatts 
to run the machine. And this is continuous operating uh, uh, power requirement. I can tell you no agency is going to fund a computer that requires $100 million to keep it just running. And, and so that is driving new technology in the computer field that is not only going to impact supercomputing, but it, you, you will see that Im impacting in your day-to-day -day life because it's also going to come into the consumer marketplace. These are barriers. Uh, I'm not going to go into details, but basically you need factor of five to factor of 100 improvements from business as usual in terms of what the industry would do. So this basically that means we have to co-invest with industry to accelerate the technology that they have. So I want to take the last sort of five minutes to touch on graduate education. Um, Oak Ridge has been engaged in graduate education throughout its history. Right from the inception of the, of the laboratory to, to today, this has been uh, a really important part of it. From time to time, it becomes part of the administration's priority, and sometimes it's not. But for Oak Ridge, it has always been a priority. And uh, we are getting ready to establish an Oak Ridge Institute for Energy Science. We are uh, hoping to reach out and collaborate with our partner universities. Those logos that you see are members who sit on the board that manages the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And, uh, and we hope that this will lead to a, a broad-based collaboration in a number of areas where it makes sense uh, certainly with Vanderbilt, but also other universities around the country. Uh, the first instantiation of the program has been launched, uh, launched by the University of Tennessee. The governor announced this uh, to the legislature two days ago. Uh, um, basically, um, there's a, a new distinguished fellowship program between UT and ORNL and an expanded graduate education where the governor has an expectation that about 200 or so of Oak Ridge scientists will have faculty appointments at, uh, at, a, at, the, at the university uh, and, uh, uh, and, and that each of those uh, Oak Ridge based faculty would mentor about two graduate students or so. Uh, this is not so unusual for us. We today have about 135 or so graduate students year round at Oak Ridge. During the summer we get about 800 undergraduates during the summer months. And uh, we have about 300 or so postdocs uh, resident at Oak Ridge. Uh, we expect that this, is, uh, this program, in partnership with the universities, will take us to about 500 graduate students and about 500 postdocs. And the, the way we see it is that we want to focus on translational research, um, basically tying uh, our basic sciences to applied technology and also where there makes, makes sense, uh, help uh, foster an entrepreneurial culture at the, uh, at, at the laboratory. Um, this is, uh, in, in some sense, we've always done this. These three bubbles have been separated. We are trying to bring it together so that it actually have a purposeful impact on economic development uh, uh, and, and community outreach. And, and so this is an exciting adventure. Uh, just beginning, we will see, you know, only time will tell how successful we will be. And so uh, with that, uh, I want to thank you for this opportunity to speak with you this evening. Um, I tried to give you a sort of high level overview of uh, what makes Oak Ridge tick and give you a sense of uh, some of the priorities, particularly some of the challenges that face in the energy area and computing. And I know uh, it's about that time, so if you have uh, a question or two, I'll be happy to entertain it. Uh, and I won't be offended if you don't have any questions, because usually I give very clear lectures. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have time for a couple of questions. So, from an outside view,
Um, you know, um, uh, the laboratory is comprised of people who are trained by academia. We are wonderful, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we thrive, research is, thrives by competition and collaboration. So uh, usually DOE funds, not laboratories, D DOE funds people and the best ideas drive research. So it's not entirely surprising that you have um, every laboratory doing everything, particularly at the superficial level. Uh, you know, from an outsider's perspective. But there are certain things that are um, uh, fairly clear. When it comes to nuclear energy, uh, the department has one nuclear energy laboratory. That is Idaho. Okay. Um, it is much more designed as a demonstration project. Uh, I, you know, you cannot stand up an institution and wave a magic wand and you know, immediately have 40, 50 years worth of expertise and experience uh, uh, resident in that organization. So I think that when I look, when I, when, from a department's perspective, Idaho is very important because that's where the demonstration project is. But they, when it comes to research, uh, there are two other laboratories probably, but two laboratories where the substantial amount of historical expertise as well as the facilities that go along with that expertise reside. And that I would say would be Los Alamos and Oak Ridge. And, and so, if, if there is a nuclear renaissance from a national laboratory perspective, the three labs that are uh, crucial to that renaissance would be uh, Idaho, Los Alamos, and Oak Ridge. Now, I happen to think that Oak Ridge is much better than the other two, but then you know, I'm paid to think that way. <laughs> I, I actually believe that that is the case. W what I will tell you is, is the following. Um, uh, this country is not yet polit this country is not yet ready to embrace nuclear energy, okay? Uh, what you should look is, uh, you know, it's easy when there is money, uh, everybody goes after the money. But what you, you, the, the strength of your conviction will be manifested by investments that an institution makes before there is funding. And so you should look to see whether Oak Ridge is making the kind of investments in attracting the next generation of talented staff, uh, infrastructure, etc., even before there is a big program, because only then can you be ready when the nation asks you to, to step up and solve the problem, and you would see that Oak Ridge is going to do that. Computing, without a doubt, uh, Oak Ridge is there. Neutrons, without a doubt, Oak Ridge is there. So if you pick three or four areas, materials, microscopy. So there are some key technology and research areas where everybody does things, but we believe that we are the unquestioned leaders in some of those areas. There was another question in the back somewhere. I'm sorry? Uh, you have to explain what peak oil theory is. Well, I think, uh, I mean, I believe that we are already, um, every nation is accounting for a depletion of oil. I mean, we, there, you know, uh, um, in order to, you know, an offshore uh, exploration of a new, you know, if you're digging for uh, oil, uh, it costs, rig itself costs a million dollars, is that right, let me do the, uh, million dollars a day is what it costs to have an offshore rig come in and do the exploration. Uh, they were expecting oil in offshore of, uh, of uh, the southern coast of India. And after four, four months of drilling and going almost a mile down, they didn't find any oil. Imagine the cost that they just, you know, sunk cost. So we are already to the point where I don't think that we, there is a dramatic uh, uh, we are going to find dramatic new uh, oil uh, deposits. 
at some point in time, the tar sands in, in uh, Canada is going to become competitive as the price goes up. But it's very, very clear that it's a diminishing resource. Fundamentally, it's a diminishing resource. And so uh, I think not only this country, but, uh, but uh, China, for example, that has a two trillion uh, uh, foreign currency reserve is investing heavily in green technology. So uh, I, I think it is probably more than a theory. It's, it's, a, it's a reality. I think maybe uh, we will close it off here and go to the reception. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.